Hello and welcome to this edition, De Facto Review, a weekly roundup of the biggest issues shaping Mongolia. Here with us tonight is guest commenter Ankbayer Belgun, and I'm Terence Edwards. We're live on Facebook at V Television. We want to hear your thoughts, so send us your comments on Twitter with hashtag jargle underscore de facto. Coming up on the program. Heineken to acquire Apu shares in merger. Wildfire sparking countryside during scorching summer. And we're off to the races with the 2017 Summer Yak Festival. We begin our program with a story on the new president. President Haltma Batolik is stirring the pot already in Ulaanbaatar with his announcement for the dismissal of Ambassadors S. Bayer from the United Kingdom and M. M. Engsaken from Sweden. Mongolia's fifth president has called for the resignation for their alleged, alleged collusion with M. Enkbolt during the campaigns in June and July. The decision is not yet final as parliament is currently on recess, but President Padolga is arguing that he has the power to dismiss foreign service personnel without reason. Batolik's new chief of staff, former parliament speaker and Democratic Party leader Zandahu Enkbolt says that demonstrations were a clear sign of the people's rejection of the appointment to the post. The appointment was somewhat controversial because of alleged corruption allegations related to the undisclosed offshore accounts. So, Bill Goon, let's get started. Do you think these resignation, these dismissals are justified? Or is this politics tit for tat? Is this an ax to grind with Mongolian's People's Party? Well, there's a uh actually two or three sides to the story. Okay. Um, now, I believe the, these ambassadors will not get re recalled. I think this um, political showing, uh, in, in, uh, well, at least the political move um, to, re uh, to try to initiate recall of the ambassadors will be blocked at the, at the parliament level. And that is only my personal opinion. Um, because um, when you look at the Mongolian Foreign Service, uh, we actually have quite a long history of, a long history and quite a consistent policy for Mongolian uh, foreign policy. Um, when you look at our um, overall foreign policy kind of um, initiatives and, and service, uh, services to, mi missions to various countries, we have 31 embassies and 12 general consuls. And it's a, it's a quite um, large um, program for a country of Mongolia's size. And um, one thing that I tried to, uh, try to clarify on exactly what this um, um, ambassador's recall was that uh, is there any um, regulation or any legislation that calls for um, any kind of ground for dismissal or ground for recall? Of well, but Tolik's arguing that he doesn't need one. <laughs> well, actually, there, there is none. There is no yeah. regulation that says this is exactly why you need to recall ambassadors. When you look at an average term an ambassador serves, and it's an unofficial, from an unofficial source at the, the foreign ministry, it's three to four years in Mongolia. So, and there has been instances where the ambassadors were, were recalled uh, within one year period, and w which will be the case for both Ambassador Bayer and Ambassador Ingsak. Um, and there is also uh, a rule of thumb to recall ambassadors. Um, and the main uh, kind of causes for recalling ambassadors was um, basically uh, not working and not coordinating with Mongolian foreign policy, number one. And number two, a damaging relations between uh, other, other countries. Sure. So when you look at uh, Mr. Ingsachen, uh, Mr. Ingsachen uh, was appointed ambassador in April 27th to Sweden and uh, Mr. Bayer uh, on March 1st of 2017. So they're just a few months into the ambassador's role and a potential recall, a talk of potential recall of these ambassadors would very much be uh, damaging for, in my opinion, Mongolia's reputation. Because both of these countries, uh, Sweden and, um, and Great Britain are uh, significant economic partners. 
to Mongolia as well as social uh, as well as um, social developments in the education sector. Yeah. yeah, you know, as an American, I can't help but constantly compare these events to America. And one of Trump's first decisions was to recall ambassadors as well. So it's not completely unprecedented around the world. I'm sure countries will understand. Yeah. but it is. You know, the president, you know, coming into a room, making a lot of noise, showing, setting an example, showing yeah. he's got the power to do things. Yeah, well, when you look at Mongolia, we're sandwiched between the largest two, one of the largest two countries in, in the world. Sure. And our foreign policy is where we're supposed to be the strongest. And so far since 1990s to, to current uh, date, to present, um, our foreign, uh, foreign services has been, in my opinion, uh, exceptionally well run. Um, and surprisingly stayed away from all this political rhetoric. Yeah. And I wish for it to stay, stay that way in the, in the future. Well, it seems like politics is a contagion, so <laughs> not possible. You know, this is the sort of powers that the legislator hopes to strip the president of yeah. with some proposed amendments to the Constitution. Do you think this will incentivize Parliament to act more quickly to get those amendments passed so that they can stay on course with their own agenda and where are we exactly with these amendments? Well, the unofficial news is that there is already a draft uh, amendment document that's available. And uh, we should expect the amendment talks to start surfacing by the, the fall parliament session. Okay. Which will hopefully start in, in November. So now, just weeks away. Yeah, well, well, November. Yeah, so November, some months so away. Some months away. Um, regarding the, the reason that we need uh, amendments to the Constitution, I am somehow supportive of this issue because generally look at, uh, look at business in Mongolia, look at foreign investments coming in. What everyone talks about, what everyone complains about is Mongolia's instability. And instability when it comes to um, pol politicking and public services getting mixed up. And I believe this is a, a perfect case uh, for these two ambassadors because just in the Mongolian uh, in the Mongolian version of the show, Mogi and I were t discussing, and Mogi brought up a very interesting point, which was... You're talking about the Mongolian show that precedes this one, <laughs> just so everyone knows. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we were talking about the, the current ambassadors also tweeting through their public um, Twitter account very political messages as well, and that's, that's a sign of things not, not really working out. And we need a, a clear division between the government and uh, government services and the politics. So you said you're doubtful that this will get passed. Yes. So is there anything else he can do to try and rescind these posts? Because obviously Sweden and UK are quite desirable. You know, it is good politics to reward, you know, your underlings with these <laughs> posts. And I don't mean that as a, a slight against Mongolia. This is what happens in the States as well. Well, um, I really do not see any uh, much bigger issues coming up because um, the, the parliament will need to approve uh, to recall these um, ambassadors. And yeah. I think right now that the president's office and the parliament are just um, too, too far apart for them to come to a uni unified conclusion. Okay, it's definitely worth watching. Yeah. And we're definitely going to continue watching the president because he is a bit of a wild card. <laughs> so we'll keep you updated. Our second story has to do with a, the Heineken acquiring a Mongolian company. The Dutch beer and beverage giant Heineken is taking a large interest in the Mongolian market with the acquisition of a quarter of Mongolia's own beer and vodka producer, Apu. Heineken's local holding company, Evergreen Investment, is merging with Mongolia's largest beer and beverage company for a deal with an undisclosed value. Apu's majority share owner, I'm sorry, Apu's major majority owner, Shunklai Group, will retain majority ownership in the deal, with remaining shares listed on the Mongolia Stock Exchange. The merger is expected to close before the end of the year. So M&A activity has been quite slow. There's been not a lot of noise about such deals. Is this the biggest we've seen in some years? And what does this mean for the, the MSC investors? Well, obviously, this creates a very uh, strong Mongolian brand. Now, uh, there is no new additional investment being done. It's basically Heineken first came to Mongolia in 2012 uh, through their $20 million investment into Grand Han LLC. 
and Grand Han LLC had a very strong brand of vodkas and, and um, alcoholic beverages. Yes. Um, and it's very interesting uh, from Heineken's perspective. They've spent five years in Mongolia, and now that they decide to merge with Apo and own a strategic 25% uh, share, kind of suggests that uh, the weakness in Mongolia's uh, beverage market over the past five years. Apparently, they did not uh, see the kind of growth potential that they were trying to uh, that they were trying to see. So I, I see this as um, very much a merger uh, activity that's taking place on the bottom of the market. And it's, a, it's an opportune time for Heineken to be also getting involved in Apo as well because the prices have been so depressed. Um, and this creates uh, another synergy basically from an export uh, market perspective because Apo was spending significant amount of money in their uh, international marketing and sure. I'm sure Heineken itself was spending significant amounts as well and for for these two firms to merge together and create uh, one larger company is going to uh, create a lot of synergies in my opinion. You know Apu is an interesting company it's long been an investor's favorite on the MSC from what I understand yeah. and if you visit the factory they have a really state-of-the-art facility for their warehousing you yeah. know it's really impressive and it's really what it's doing is it's servicing the entire country from he, from that one warehouse. So Apu's a little bit ahead of the curve already. So what can this deal, how can it help Apu's brand and their distribution, do you think? Well, when you look at Apu, um, right now the, the whole company is valued at approximately $130 million. And uh, last year's revenues was $86 million. Um, that was down slightly from uh, the previous year, which was in 2015, the, the company had $87.5 million of revenue. But the surprising part is in 2016, uh, Apo's uh, profits dropped surprisingly to $1.16 million, down from $4.6 million in 2015. So this shows the kind of weakening, uh, the, the, the whole economic um, crisis affecting on, on Apu's Sure, purchasing uh, power has fallen. Purchasing power. Um, so the, maybe they're looking, looking at their export, as I've said before, export markets and the way Heineken could potentially help in that. And Do you have any idea what export markets Mongolia could tap into? China, for example? Well, exactly. Well, the only reason any foreign serious investor comes to Mongolia is to export to the largest market in the world. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> and. Uh, Looking at China, do you think Mongolia's beer and vodka have a good chance to make a to make an impression on the market? Well, absolutely. Mongolians have always tried to tap into this Mongolia brand, the, the vodka brand, to showcase their um, abilities, their advantages in international markets. Um, and I think this is again um, what Apple is really trying to do. And I think the biggest winner from this deal is. Um, to be honest, Apo, uh, basically, yeah. because they get a significant international partner coming in, which will potentially be helping them in terms of financing and in terms of expertise going yeah. into the future. Yeah, it's definitely a good sign. You know, we have, as I mentioned, we have seen very little activity, especially from foreign investment. And it's also nice to see some money coming in for something other than mining, other than banking as well. I think the only deal I can remember that was close to it was when TDB had a purchase. I believe it was Goldman Sachs? Yeah. Goldman yeah, Sachs, great. Right. Yeah. That was some years ago. So it's definitely good to see some branching out. And I think Mongolia's got a lot of opportunity with its agriculture sector. It would be nice to see some companies come in, do something with beef, do something with vodka. I'm sorry, not vodka. Do something with dairy. Do you th see any other areas that have some real potential? Maybe Kashmir. Well, um, the cashmere industry is quite interesting, um, and it's becoming much more um, stronger for Mongolia right now. As the surprising move, uh, the surprising trend was as economic crisis deepened in Mongolia, it, it, uh, it actually made a lot of cashmere producers very profitable because their costs are decreasing on one, one hand side, sure, and at the same time their uh, revenue is increasing on the other hand. So. During one thing that we've learned from the past crisis is uh, whenever there is economic troubles in Mongolia, they uh, try to get into a cashmere business. And uh, now there, there's notable strong players in the cashmere sector, just 
over the past five years, basically, that's yeah. created. Yeah. You know, the, the trouble with cashmere is really it's the upstream garments, you know. Yeah. We do have some activity. We have Gobi flagships abroad. But again, I don't know how well they're doing. You know, I, I don't see it make a big impression on the share price, at least. Do you? Well, Gobi for now is still a very, um, how do you say, um, kind of not really moving as fast, growing as fast as it should. Um, yeah. So that's why I think, I think the whole uh, uh, company should try to get into this another merger activity buy some of their uh, competitors and build a bigger brand to be competing in international markets. Yeah. All right, it's definitely something to continue watching. Our third story for the program deals with the wildfires spreading throughout the country. Teams of emergency officials and volunteers responded to wildfires set ablaze in three provinces this week amid another scorching summer this year. More than 20 fires were burning last week, blanketing Olimbatar in a heavy cloud with the smell of charred wood from the winds pushing the smoke south. The fires were ablaze amid low rainfall, under one millimeter in some areas, during what is being called the warmest summer in more than half a century. Exports of fada have already been banned by the government in anticipation of tight supply. That's following warnings of a 40% shortfall in this year's grain production. Drought can be a precursor to the Mongolian winter disaster called the Zud, as herders rely on wheat and animal fodder to feed their animals when there is heavy snow cover over the pasture land. So, Bill Goon, what do you know exactly about the damage caused by these fires and how is it really going to affect things? And is this year's incident revealing any bottlenecks in response to fires in the countryside? Yeah. Um, as as Mongolian authorities have reported, about 12.8 thousand hectares of land has been uh, destroyed by fire, and uh, there are various uh, there are various claims about who's the, the reason for the fire. Um, the official statement is that 90% of the, the fire was started due to human activities. Okay, so camping, etc. Camping, etc. Um, a vodka glass uh, from uh, a picnic acting Burning as a man's effect. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, uh, when uh, contacting the uh, Ministry of Environment and asking for um, an unofficial statement, uh, the professionals over there have co uh, are explaining this with a bit more scientific um, background. Sure. Um, what they're suggesting is that this fire, um, uh, widespread fire activities in, in Mongolia is not, this year is actually quite notable because this was close to Lambatar, but this happens in waves and it's in cycles. Uh, due to a grass growing um, every year and dying off, it creates a lot of dead grass. Sure, and, and that's that just Kindle. As, yeah, that acts as a fuel for lots of this fire, and this year happens to coincide with this, um, uh, with the, the probably the driest uh, summer, and uh, it's been widely reported that 2017 June was the, the hottest uh, month in 56 recorded. years. Yeah. I read. Yeah, so um, you know, with all, it's kind of like a perfect storm. Um, various factors go, coming in and contributing to this. So. Um, I don't think this, there was much more human activities. You know, n n Mongolians are not suddenly going to start picnicking and you know, start, uh, cause, uh, start starting fires with their vodka glasses this year. You know? Mongolians are living their typical life, but it's just uh, more of a natural effect, in my opinion. Yeah, but certainly human activities can not only stop them from occurring, but it can prevent them if people are aware. Absolutely. You know, in, yeah. Again, I, I keep speaking about my country, but we have uh, campaigns, yeah. educational yeah. programs on the television to tell people, you know, how to prevent. Yeah. You know, we have Smokey the Bear. Yeah. And the U.S. is also very prone to, prone to fire as well. Yes, exactly. California all the time. Yeah. Another interesting um, side note on this uh, issue is um, the United Nations have done a survey in Mongolia, and apparently global warming uh, speed in Mongolia is uh, twice as high as the average, global average. And the rapid desertification is becoming serious problems. Um, as I remember, we've never seen um, this very uh, 
heavy kind of dust storms come into Ulaanbaatar city. Sure. Uh, but uh, the heavy du dust storm called Waltz, right? It's uh, a big wall of dust coming into the city. And this spring, I've seen, I've seen two of them, and it was very surprising. About five, six years ago, that was only seen in, in Gobi Desert. And I believe uh, desertification plays a, a major role into this. And once it becomes desertification, environmental issues, one thing that the Mongolian public really overlooks is the composition of Mongolia's herd uh, numbers. Mongolia has 60 million livestock, and about 25 million of them are goats. Yeah. And cashmere goats. <laughs> yes. Um, and this is another sign of our policy backfiring and uh, creating an additional problem for Mongolia because uh, if you remember several years ago, the government has started giving cash to uh, each goats. And now that there's uh, too many goats, it's definitely playing into uh, the acceleration of the certification in Mongolia. Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of frustrating because definitely the politicians like to pander to the herders and goats are very popular among mm -hmm. them. Yeah. But unfortunately, that doesn't always translate to the best activities for the environment. You know, speaking with some researchers, the heavy, it's not so much the number of goats, but the density of goats. You know, I, I kind of like to liken it to a financial portfolio as an, an investor, you know. It's good to have some, some spread. Yeah. You, you want to have a little bit of cow investment, a little bit of goat and camel investment, a little bit of sheep. And with a diverse portfolio, you can really kind of prevent the what what goats do is they eat to the root yeah. but if you have that diversity in your herd you can kind of prevent you know just eating it so many animals eating it to the root because they won't go after you know the already munched on grass the, the, there so that does help the oh absolutely the situation yeah and you've you've actually had, had very nice um <coughs> comparison to portfolio, I think we should have much more uh, diverse portfolio. Actually, the, the rule of thumb for nomads previous to this government policies was uh, one goat for every 10 sheep. And I think that's, uh, that's a very, uh, very smart um, sort of way to, way to live for the, for the nomads. But um, it's unfortunate that this uh, uh, way of lifestyle is uh, disrupted by Sure. Government policies. You know, yeah, and it's hard to, definitely it's hard to regulate it, yeah. especially people out in the countryside. One of the, the shortfalls I've seen, in, at least in the tax policy, is herds go tax-free. They could definitely, you know, put a tax at least on heads of cashmere goats because it's a very profitable industry. It's, li it's almost like not taxing gold, you know. It's a very valuable commodity, so they tax it. Absolutely, and uh, for current politicians and for current parliament, it's very hard for them to tax their... <laughs> well, if they want to keep their seats, uh, well, sure. Very true, yeah, and you know, this is again going into the politics and this constant circle of three years of poli uh, elections is what's really causing this. So, I, real quickly, can you explain how drought can actually lead to this winter disaster known as the Zud? Well, and there is uh, various, um, in my opinion, uh, all ancient myths about it. And okay. probably it's some sort of correlation that the nomads have seen that uh, drought in the summer leads to Zod. But I do not <laughs> really know the scientific explanation. Sure, behind. sure. Well, it's definitely, you can look at the economic side. Yeah. When you have drought, that means less crop production and then less wheat for the fall. And yeah. when you have less wheat, that means less fodder for the animals. So even if you don't have a really bad winter, you'll, if you don't have enough fodder, then it can get quite tight and your animals start starving. Mm. So there's definitely a, at least an economic link there mm. because when you look at exports, they're more expensive than the domestically grown stuff. Mm. So if you're a wealthy herder, you definitely have an edge. But you know, as, as it gets more tight and you're looking for fodder for your animals, it gets quite tough. Yeah, it seems like a very reasonable yeah. explanation. <laughs> there's always an economic side to these yeah. things. All right, our final story. Yaks are on their marks and ready to race for the 2017 Yak Festival in Batoltisom over Hungai this week. Spectators are traveling to the Orhan River Valley in anticipation of races, rodeos, polos, and much more at the event. Mongolia is home to the world's second largest yak population after Tibet. For herders, they are domesticated for their sale 
for the sale of their thick, warm walls and clean burning done for keeping warm in winter. So is this something you've ever been to? Is this something you hope to get to someday? Well, someday. Uh, someday. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, I haven't seen the, the Yak Festival myself. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can say, you know, I've never shared it on the program, but I spent two years in over Hungai as a Peace Corps volunteer. I lived in a place called Oyang Som, which is not too, f it's a little far from that Tulsi. It's actually the most difficult thing is the terrain to get there. It can Have be you seen quite the Yak snowy. Festival yourself? I've not seen the Yak, no. Yak Festival, so I, I am a little embarrassed of that. It actually sounds like it's quite uh, an interesting festival from the way it was described and how the yaks were racing. And, yeah. Uh, and that would be, that'd be some, some sight to see. You know, I've always seen tourism as the kind of forgotten industry in Mongolia. People love to talk about it, but, you know, actions are quite sparse. Yeah. Is this something you think they can market towards foreign tourists? Well, definitely. This is, in my opinion, I think the only way Mongolia can attract foreign tourists is to showcase our uh, nomadic way of life, and sure. to showcase Mongolia's culture. Uh, many people talk about Mongolian nature being top-notch and pristine, but I believe there is additional um, destinations that offer uh, various you know, better choices for many tourists. Sure. And for leisure tourists, there's also a better destination as well. And for Mongolian tourism companies, they need to assess their situation from a very realistic and pragmatic perspective. And festivals like this, and if you remember during the winter, there is a winter festival on the, the ice festival. Yes, up north. Uh, yeah. And now this Yak Festival, um, to, the, to the west there is the Eagle Festival as well. And these kind of festivals that really shows the nomadic way of life in this open step is what's really going to cause many uh, foreign tourists to come to Mongolia. Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest issue is they got to get the word, word out. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the Eagle Festival. And Mongolia got a lot of free commercials just from that film that came out last year. Or is it Eagle this Huntress, year? Eagle Huntress, yeah. Came out last year, I believe. The last Eagle Hunt. The Eagle Huntress. Yeah. So definitely, you know, some, they, they don't have to all be feature movies, but putting out some videos on YouTube, you know, they did, they did some commercials on Bloomberg, I saw, and some other programs, but they didn't really show these festivals, like real opportunities for people to come in at specific times. Absolutely. I think there, is, there should be more coordinated effort in trying to promote these events internationally. And uh, to be honest with you, these kind of um, real um, interesting events that attract many people have several things in common. They, they run consistently from year to year and yeah. they have champions who champion it behind it. And I would like to actually give a lot of credit to my foreign friends and you know, to expats, including yourself, living in Mongolia and promoting Mongolia's culture to the rest of the world. And you know, that's the way to actually preserve instead of just promoting it among Mongolians. Uh, we need more expats to be, um, to be championing this. And another Famous example is uh, the Mongol rally that takes place uh, from... That's actually a sad subject <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you actually tried? I haven't tried it, but it's yeah. sad to see that negative marketing and campaigns actually led to it being moved from ending in Mongolia to Russia. Hmm. I thought that was a great program because yeah. it was getting people all over the country. You know, there's a problem where there's tourists, but they kind of go to one, two, three spots in the Gobi, maybe a little time in UV, whereas this was taking people to really far out flung places. And negative campaigns saying that, you know, they're just leaving their trash and junk cars here, which I really disagree with, led to it being moved. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Um, as you remember, um, many foreign friends, they come here and uh, they do start their small, uh, small close community and they start some tradition which eventually moves on to become a festival and you know hopefully someday the Yak Festival could be something like uh, the, the Spanish Bull Run. Yeah exactly <laughs> you know it just takes a little bit of cre creativity but you really gotta get the word out yeah. there and just throwing money at the problem like they did with ITV Berlin where they showed up but what came of that? Yeah, well, on the other hand, though, um, when it comes to uh, the, the Mongolia's kind of government's effort in trying to uh, develop our tourism industries, uh, in my opinion, not, not as very um, accurate. Uh, That's going to be the final word on this. <laughs> okay. That's our program for the evening. We hope our briefings have given you a leg up as you enter the work week on Monday. So we'll catch you later. Good night, Olambatar.